The information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Foundation podcast with Dominic Frisby, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Luke Johnson is the chairman of private equity house Risk Capital Partners Limited. He's also the part owner and chairman of Super Brands, Giraffe Restaurants, Patisserie Valerie, Baker and Spice, and a major owner and director of the market leader in car park equipment, Apt Controls. He was chairman of Channel 4 from 2004 to 2010, and is also chairman of the Royal Society of Arts. He writes a weekly column for the FT and wrote a, for the Sunday Telegraph for eight years. And one of his pieces he wrote for the FT back in November is going to be the subject of today's podcast. Luke, thank you very much for agreeing to come on the show. The title of that piece was A Guide to Shaking Off the Doom and Gloom. Um, why don't we start by the importance, I suppose, of, of shaking off the, 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 this doom and gloom that is pervading the world at the moment? Well, I think human society progresses through the optimists who believe in a positive future and can see a way towards advancement and progress. And they might be inventors, they might be entrepreneurs, they might even be politicians. Uh, they could be leaders across many fields of endeavour from educators to writers. But the truth is that if a society develops a negative and pessimistic outlook in terms of the future, then uh, where do they go? And so I, I think what has happened is that the media has become more pervasive than ever. We don't now just have print and broadcast media, we have a, an infinite amount of internet communications of one sort or another as well as traditional media like magazines and radio and so forth. And as a consequence, the belief amongst far too many editors and such like that bad news sells and the competitive nature of the media industry means that the headlines, uh, apocalyptic doom type uh, uh, screaming headlines are more pervasive than ever. And so it's very difficult in modern life with rolling news channels and everything else to escape the mood of negativity promulgated in part by the media. And so I think it's very important for particularly uh, leaders of industry and political leaders and others to present the alternative, which I think is perfectly rational and is actually based on, in my opinion, a historical fact that throughout history, man has ultimately advanced and things have got better. And it's very hard sometimes to realise that if you simply go by, you know, the um, the daily news. So uh, pessimism is a, is a self-fulfilling prophecy in, in, I suppose, is, is that what you're, what you're saying? Not necessarily, because I think ultimately um, the those optimists and positive thinkers and innovators will triumph as they always have in the long run. Uh, but I think you can get into circumstances where, for example, um, societies birth rates collapse because people are so fearful for the future that they don't reproduce. And, you know, that leads ultimately to extinction, doesn't it? And that is a very depressing thought. And um, I do believe that you know, it's incumbent upon us for the sake of our children as much as anything to believe in Churchill's sunlit uplands, the other side of whatever challenges and difficulties we might face in the immediate future. Um, I, I couldn't agree with you more, but just taking the other side of the argument just for a second, a pessimist might argue that he's not being pessimistic, he's merely being realistic and confronting the various problems that we have, and unless you confront those problems, they won't be solved. Whereas an optimist is someone who perhaps just ignores them or glosses over them. What would you say to that? Well, I think you have to be rational about things. I think that uh, 
clearly you don't want to be in denial about the problems we might or might not face. But the fact is, I think we, as, a, as an animal, get very quickly used to a higher level of material comfort, for example, than used to be the case. And there is also this curious tendency amongst us to look on the past with rose-tinted spectacles and believe that in some measure things used to be better. On many, many uh, tests, I would argue, things were worse in the past. And certainly if you go back some way, they were much worse. And generally speaking, I think it will be the case that things will be better overall in the future. That is a great deal thanks to business and thanks to technological progress. And it's also thanks to education and the dissemination of information and so forth. And for example, I mean, just one measure that's nothing to do with economics. If you look at the number of wars being fought now compared to virtually at any time in history, there are fewer. And certainly in the last hundred years, that's the case. And you very rarely see these sort of things reported. I think part of the problem is that bad news is a sudden disaster or a, a newsworthy event. Good news is very often small incremental elements of progress. For example, the recovery rates from cancer these days compared to what they used to be only 20 years ago, let alone 50 years ago. That isn't a headline because it's lots of uh, modest improvements yeah. that over time build up into a transformed rate of recovery for a deadly disease. And these things matter dramatically, but they aren't dramatic in how they occur or are announced. And I think that's very often the case. Also, I think we are wired for evolutionary reasons to be fearful and to be cautious and therefore um, to assume the worst in preparation and um, uh, you know, let the adrenaline flow, f flow because uh, it, it, it's natural to prepare for disaster in case it happens, even though it virtually never does, um, is useful. But if you take, for example, the way in which um, there is, if you like, exaggerated reporting of plane crashes or um, disasters at sea, one would get the impression that travel by that means is very dangerous. In fact, it's virtually the safest form of transport known to man and incredibly safe compared to other forms of transport. Rail is the same, but because a uh, train crash makes visually and otherwise good headlines and good stories. So, you know, you, you might get the impression that this was a common occurrence, mm -hmm. that rail travel was dangerous and that um, we shouldn't use the trains. Balmy. Um, so I think it's partly this counteraction to the way in which we're saturated with news and news has a tendency to towards the gloomy and the disastrous but i think it's also a an entre entrepreneurial spirit that we need to foster a spirit of adventure because it's only by experimentation by taking risks measured risks analyzed risks but nevertheless taking risks that we advance and surely life is about progress rather than stagnation and that must be the worst of all worlds so it is about trying new things uh, exploring discoveries etc and at the heart of all that is a sense of optimism because I don't believe pessimists do any of that um, I'm reminded of Churchill's quote, our greatest regrets are not for what we have done, but for what we haven't done. Um, it would be interesting to know, do, do, uh, I wonder if you could uh, chart whether pessimists make more money than optimists uh, when trading the stock market. I bet you opti optimists make more. Well, I don't know. Uh, unquestionably in business and particularly in passive investing, if you like, uh, there is an argument to say a healthy dose of cynicism is quite valuable because the stock market is full of promoters and others who will exaggerate and are over optimistic and you know some of them certainly fantasists however uh, ultimately I think 
my experience has been that in investing, firstly, you need patience. Secondly, you need to take a long view. And thirdly, you need companies and industries that are growing. And that combination of factors leads one to the, to the view that you need an optimistic frame of mind, i.e. you need to believe that that management team or that business or that industry that they serve has good prospects and is going to grow rather than, you know, short selling, uh, which is very much, I would argue, a pessimist's uh, outlook and temperamentally certainly doesn't suit me. So I like the idea of being a part of a business, backing and running businesses that are expanding and creating jobs and leading into the future in, in a progressive way. Very good. Now, you've got about uh, 10, or, 10 or so um, things that individuals can do to boost morale, and we've covered a couple of them already. Avoid the news is one of them. Study history. Um, uh, I mean, let's just quickly go back to that study history. But the the no no we've covered study history. The third on that list is spend time with young people. Yes, I think people are born happy and essentially optimistic. The two things coalesce, and I think they remain that way. You know, well into their young adulthood, adulthood in general, because there is a naivety, perhaps an innocence of youth, uh, but there is also a sort of belief in infinite possibilities and I think if you surround yourself as much as you can with people of that age and outlook then it's infectious and it's hard not to be stirred in a good way by their sense of belief that things will improve and uh, that must lift the spirits and so therefore you know avoid too much of the company of those cynical, sceptical types who are very often, I'm afraid to say, close to the end of their lives in the beginning, who inevitably <laughs> sensing their mortality, um, you know, it's hard not to take a slightly gloomier outlook. Um, young people in their teens and twenties and so forth, inevitably they have everything in front of them and so they are more likely to be optimistic about the possibilities. You, you see that with countries as well. I always find when I go to the States, I find it in, an, in, well, an incredibly uncynical, optimistic place, whereas mm -hmm. we're in the UK, which is in many ways an older country than the States, yes. we're a lot more cynical. Well, it's not just we are an older country, you know, but by, I read today, by 2020, the population of America, on average, will be younger than not just in Europe, but also in China. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting? And that is one of the remarkable things of America is throughout the decades and indeed centuries, it's remained a young country demographically and it renews itself through immigration and through reproduction. And this is incredibly healthy. Whereas, for example, I would argue that Italy is a rather depressed country. It has some of uh, the lowest birth rates in North Italy in the entire world they are simply not replacing themselves now. And look at their economy. And I think the two things are not unconnected. Even though I love Italy and I think the Italians are wonderful, inventive people, I think, uh, you know, you, you wonder whether countries like that have embraced a sense of despair. And uh, that is very frightening. Demographics is destiny, somebody said. Um, so w spend time with young people. And, and your next one is avoid pessimists, which we've kind of come at a, c covered as well. Remain rational. The worst almost never happens. Um, would you care to comment on that one? Well, I think it's simply stop, if, if you suffer from it, stop being paranoid, stop exaggerating the um, dangers in life uh, and get real, you know. Uh, there is a, a slight sense that in many ways the health and safety lobby and others can frighten one into hardly getting out of bed in the morning because something might go wrong. Of course it will, yes, that's the nature of the world. It's not perfect and unquestionably accidents happen and so forth. But we've got to keep moving and ultimately, you know, tragedies and disasters are increasingly rare in life and even those you meet who've had terrible things happen to them can be surprisingly upbeat about their circumstances once they get used to it.
But what is miserable, I think, is going around in a fearful state because you've taken too seriously those amongst us who would, for particular reasons, exaggerate the threats. I, I like the line here, the vast majority of dire forecasts by commentators and supposed experts are simply nonsense. Being constantly in dread of fresh catastrophes is impractical and taints our judgment. Completely. Um, read the Stoics is uh, your next one. Yes, well, I, I, none of these points I'm making are new. People have been making them for centuries or even longer. And um, I quote the idea of studying people like Marcus Aurelius, who, you know, if you read his works, you know, had to suffer many um, pains and agonies, that, the sort of which we have no comprehension. Um, but he was one of the pioneers of, of the uh, philosophical school of Stoicism, which is that uh, ultimately, you know, the way to cope with difficulties is to remain pragmatic about them, ultimately, rather than get emotional and uh, irrational about them. And uh, I think reading from great writers like him and others uh, can itself be, um, you know, restorative of one's spirits. Very good. Admit mistakes and then move on. All of us but make bad decisions, suffer setbacks and endure failures. It's important to recognise these, but once you've accepted the error and apologised where necessary, start afresh and don't stay mired in regret. Personally, I found this useful. I've had plenty of balls ups and mistakes in my career. Um, and I've found that when I've been honest with myself and when I've been willing to talk about them, even in public occasionally, and not stay in denial, but confront them, try to learn from them, and then move on, you feel better for it. And if you bottle it all up, if you uh, pretend it hasn't happened, if you try and blame others for your own mistakes, I think, speaking personally, it's worse. And uh, I find that, uh, you know, clearly you want successes to offset the the mistakes, and ideally you want a net uh, at, at the end of the day that's positive. Um, but in order to achieve that latter success, I think you need to have dealt with the mistake of the past rather than hidden it and pretended it didn't happen. Next one, it's, a, it's an old one, but it's a good one, get fit. Yes, unquestionably throughout history people have known that those who take exercise and remain in good shape are happier mentally. And uh, there's a good story I seem to recall from the 19th century where a particular patient went to a, a, a doctor in London who was meant to be an expert at dealing with mental problems and this patient suffered from what they used to call melancholy and he said, what shall I do, doctor? The, patient, uh, the doctor said, ah, what you need to do is get on your horse and ride full speed immediately to Edinburgh, which the patient then did. Uh, the patient was meant to meet a particular man in Edinburgh who wasn't there. So the patient unhappily then rode all the way back to London, came round to see the doctor and said, what on earth are you telling me to do, man? The, the gentleman I was meant to see wasn't there. He said, ah, yes, but you've taken all that exercise and look how much happier you are now. <laughs> and uh, apparently it worked. I don't doubt it. Um, uh, connected, keep busy. Yes, I think that uh, being active, avoiding boredom, which in some ways I think is the greatest enemy of all, is crucial. And so mentally and ideally physically engaged in productive activities that have some purpose is part of the answer. And I think one of the tragedies that we do face as a society here, and one of the things I'd love to help cure, and in my small way I contribute to by creating jobs, is unemployment. Because I think unemployed people risk being bored, being inactive, having no purpose in life. And that's a bad state to be. And so it is about finding things to do. And if, you know, a paying job isn't possible, then perhaps working for a charity or, you know, social enterprise or something. But whatever you do, don't just sleep all day and do nothing.
Um, I like this one and I'm going to read it out. Focus on small wins. Every day each of us experience little victories that can act as encouragement. Note these modest achievements and it will generate a sense of momentum that can propel you. Yes, I was partly inspired by this in a book I, I got last year called Small Wins. I think it's called Small Wins. And it's partly about how to make discoveries. And the point they were making was that discoveries and innovations don't happen with one amazing breakthrough. It's much more the Japanese philosophy that you know called Kaizen, which is constant small improvements. And I think the same applies in building your mood. And certainly one of the ways I do it for me is I draw up checklists of things I need to do in the day. And I always stick in quite a few easy ones, almost like make a cup of coffee or something. Yeah. But something you know you can tick. And it just, you know, you're making progress. The first step's always the hardest. So make it an easy one and then the next and then the next and so on. And so I think small wins are good. And even if, you know, you didn't tackle the big challenges in a day, if you've had a few small victories, that's something. Very good. And uh, again, it's similar territory. Ignore events over which you have no control. This, I think, is very important. And I think uh, the world is full of unhappy people who feel they're powerless because they've got too upset about something over which probably they would never be able to in influence the outcome. And it might be the weather or politics or uh, persuading someone to fall in love with them who was never going to fall in love with them. And uh, I think you've got to be realistic about what is possible in life. And, you know, very, very few of us are, for example, going to be famous film or pop stars. So I think spending your whole life dreaming that that's what you could do is probably a recipe for unhappiness. So I think it's about getting things in proportion and realising those areas of your life and existence that you can have an impact and those that are completely beyond your control. And the latter ones, try to avoid getting too worked up about because there's nothing you can do. You know, so... People getting upset and gloomy because the economy shrunk. Forget that. Deal with your own microeconomy where you can have an impact. Um, you don't know this, but I also work as a comedian. And one of my, well, a few of my comedian friends who've done very well um, follow uh, sports psychology. And they use the psychology of sports very much in their, in their work in comedy. And one of them, which is, um, was in Sven Joran Jor Eriksson's book, was... Only focus, only worry about what you can affect. Because if yeah, you can't well, affect it, it's the exactly same thing. Exactly the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, concentrate on your microeconomy. This is a similar theme. Same thing. And if you run a business, look at, you know, your local community, your particular markets. Again, don't worry about what's happening in the Eurozone or across the USA as a whole, because you're not going to be able to have an impact. So it's about taking share from your neighbour frankly, rather than worrying about whether the whole market's shrinking. Very good. Uh, Felix Dennis says the same thing in his book. And finally, laugh. Yes, well, rather like the fitness point, you know, plenty of studies have been done to show that humour and uh, laughing and uh, seeing the jokes in life is one of the antidotes to gloom. And, um, you know, I think there are serious medical studies that back this up, and certainly most most of us would agree that, um, uh, you know, a, a day in which you have never laughed is, is a lost day. Absolutely right. Well, uh, Luke, thank you very much for your time. And uh, you are probably the busiest person I think I've ever met. You've got so many different activities and it's, uh, it's a huge achievement that you managed to um, perform them all so successfully. Um, so thank you very much for your time. And do you have a website you, you'd like to yes. plug or a book? Uh, you my have? website's lukejohnson.org. And last year I published a book called Start It Up, which is about starting your own business and it's published by Penguin. Okay, well, we shall link to that for, to the Amazon page and also to your website. And Luke Johnson, thank you very much. Thank you. Subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos and iTunes podcasts from our gold research section.